<clears throat> Game time. Relatable. Gotta be entertaining. I want a radio show that makes a difference. Welcome, Welcome to the Derek Ashong Experience. Experience. Get involved. The phone number. 866 Oprah XM. Twitter and Facebook. Search Oprah Radio. Streaming live online. At Oprah.com. And broadcasting now. On Sirius 195 and XM 156. This is the Derek Ashong Experience. That's right, y'all. This is the Derek Ashong Experience. This is Derek Ashong, a.k.a. DNA, coming to you live every Saturday on Sirius Radio and XM. Or the Serious 195 XM 156. For those that don't know, you can also hear us live online at facebook.com slash Derek Ashong Experience at oprahradio.com and also on ustream.tv slash Derek Ashong Experience. Now, for those who've been listening uh, to Oprah Radio just before we went live, you will have just heard Oprah's special on a really uh, difficult topic. And we're not going to mince words over here and we're not going to skip around the hard things. For those who are just joining us, I'm going to give you a little bit of preamble so we have perspective. And rest assured, we're not going to stay the whole day on these heavy things, but sometimes there are issues that face us in our life and in our world that are worth discussing. Um, And they're worth discussing because the danger in them lies not so much in what we say, but in what we don't say. And in the fact that these problems keep reinforcing and reinventing themselves and people see the same struggles time and time and time again because we haven't quite found the means or the courage or the language or or just the, the heart and understanding to really tackle them. So Miss Winfrey did something very courageous this week. If you were just listening on the air, you heard her do a live radio show. Well, it was actually live yesterday. Today was rebroadcast. Where she actually took calls about a special she had on the air earlier this week about child molesters. And she actually took the unprecedented step, uh, as far as I know, about... Uh, As far as I know, the unprecedented step of actually having these molesters come on camera, uh, no, you know, hidden voices, no hidden faces, but just to come in and talk to us about what they had done um, to people's children, sometimes their own children, and why. And... I know a lot of y'all watch the show, you know that we're going to talk about political issues, you know we're going to talk about fun stuff, last time we were kicking about the Grammys and the whole nine, and and we'll get to all of that goodness, but the main premise of this show is that we're going to seek truth, and we're going to together walk along that path to try to understand the world around us better, and I think that this is an issue that needs more understanding, Uh, if only to be able to protect our kids that much better. The show that just came on is called The Conversation Continues. That is what Oprah just had on uh, the radio, on the air. And we want to continue that conversation. We know that a bunch of you have got comments and thoughts. You can call us at 866-OPRAH-XM, 866-677-2496. We want to know what did you think of the special? Did you learn anything? Do you feel like it helped? Did you feel like it harms? Do you feel like this is something... That helps us to advance the dialogue? Do you feel like these are things that are better kept secret? How do you see this? And and what did you think? Uh, Join us. And for those of you who are just joining us online now who did not hear the special, definitely give us your your thoughts. We want to hear from you, whatever you've got to say. Do you understand the topic? Have you had personal experiences with it? Um, Also... Do you feel like this is the kind of thing that we ought to be talking about? And how do you uh, how how does it strike you? We want to hear from you. Call me now, 866 Oprah XM, 866 677 2496 Now I'm gonna be straight with you all because if I'm not, then we're this is not really the kind of experience we wanna have. It's just me yakking away and making things up and not being honest and being truthful or seeking truth in the way that we hope to do. 
So I am personally very uncomfortable with this topic. Um, and I was talking with my producers earlier this morning uh, because I think it's a hard thing. I mean, I, I don't really know what to say, you know. With a lot of the stuff that we talk about, I will have already formulated an opinion. But where's the opinion to form in this? You know, it's like this kid molested a, a child, okay, kill him. Like, it's the first thing that comes to mind. And I'm a peaceful person, and I don't want to hurt anybody, but I don't have a lot of built-in sympathy because I don't understand. Um, and I'm not here to tell you on the air that you should uh, have sympathy or you should understand. I, I, I can't tell you what to feel or what to believe on this because I do don't know exactly where I'm coming from. All I know is it's something that is really bad and it's difficult to understand why anybody would hurt a child, an innocent person who is still being created, you know? One of the things that one of these people said uh, on during the, the special, one of the molesters, is that he realized that he had actually, even though this young lady uh, the woman that he invested, uh, molested when she was a little girl was now, you know, educated and grown and doing her thing and living a good life. He realized that he had destroyed a part of her life, that he had forever changed what was possible for her. Um, and it just, it, it, it blows my mind that a person could be so selfish as to rob an innocent child of that innocence and to forever abrogate their development it doesn't mean that the person cannot be great or that they're not going to accomplish wonderful things but it does say that you know you've got to really be on some kind of strange narcissistic and frankly wicked trip to do that to someone who has no choice in the matter so we're trying to figure out how uh, to come to grips with this and how to talk about it now, part of the reason that it's so important for us to talk about it, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's uncomfortable for me and it's uncomfortable for many of you, is because we want to protect our children. Uh, for those of you who saw my uh, first interview with Miss Winfrey, actually, it was a radio interview back in the fall, and it was incredible. She had me on. We had a one-on-one -on -one conversation for an hour. And one of the things that I told her about is that, you know, in the culture that I was born in, we have this idea that it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a child. Everybody says that, but what does it really mean? What it really means is that people are responsible to one another. You know, we have to care for each other in order to realistically have a society that functions. And that caring for each other means that you will see a kid, you know, a, a seven-year-old getting into a taxi cab, holding the hand of their five-year-old brother, and the little girl and the little boy will get in the cab and go across town to their school and get out. And some adult will watch them and walk them through into their school. Now, the cabbie doesn't know the kids. The people who maybe are meet them at the school may not necessarily personally know the kid. But everyone is watching out for one another. I remember we used to go down this hill from a place called Kokrobite down towards the main city. And, and you get in a, a, a truck at the top of the hill. And someone would hand you a child into your lap and you hold them and you go down the hill and you get to the school and then you would, so oh, they would open the door, somebody would be there reaching out, you'd hand out the kid and they would walk the children to school and then the, the, the bus would go all the way down into town and we'd go about our business, right? We have this idea that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, how does that impact us when we realize that sometimes we can't trust the people that are in our village? What do we do with those villagers who are hurting our kids? And how does that shift our perspective? I want to know what y'all think. 866-OPRA-XM, 866-677-2496. Chris, you're on the air. What did you think of Oprah's special on child molesters? Um, it, I didn't actually get to see it, but I just heard her speaking. And um, mm -hmm. the grooming thing just really caught me because I never, again, never thought of it in that way. Yeah. Um, and since I listened to that, I'm driving down the road going, oh, my word, that's, that is so true. Wow. And, and have you, have you, if I can ask, have you experienced this or know anyone who's been molested or who's been a molester? 
I was molested by two different members of my family. Okay. Um, and my parents did not believe me. You, you told your parents what was happening, and they thought you were making it up, or? Yeah, I, I had told my friend, and they told me, you know, you have to go to your school counselor and tell them, and I did, not realizing that they had an obligation to tell my parents, but they had to tell them that it happened. Well, uh -huh. I came home from school that day, walked into my parents, and my mom approached me with, this is a terrible joke, I can't believe you're doing this. And I'm not a person that's ever been a prankster or a joker. Yeah. And she said, we will help them however we can. And my response was, what about me? She was said they, she would help them, the people who had molested you in whatever way they can? Yeah. And how old were you at this time, Chris? Um, at that time, I was probably 14. And it started when I was nine. Oh, my God. How did this impact your relationship with your parents? Um, to this day, there's still a wall between us, mm -hmm. but I have that, that, um, mm -hmm. that feeling, you know, of course, everybody wants to have parents and they want to have a good relationship with their parents. So yeah. I try way too hard to, to have that relationship. Yeah. And my husband's just like, I can't even believe that you can tolerate this, that you can try to have them in your life. So now this is, uh, I'm really glad that you called and I'm glad that you're our first caller on this because you're, you're actually helping me to understand some things as well. I'm wondering, do you feel that this is helpful to people about the, the special that, or at least the, the conversation on the special that you just heard on the air, do you feel that it was helpful to people to get to hear it in this way and to broach this conversation? Yeah, it's very helpful because you do, as a person who has been molested, mm -hmm. feel in some way, shape, or form, you brought this on to yourself. Got you. Chris, thank you so much for calling. I really appreciate it. You guys, join us in this conversation. It's important. We're at 866 Oprah xm 866-677-2496. Uh, and just so, for those who didn't weren't with us earlier, um, what Chris is talking about with grooming, Oprah was giving the example of people actually, you know, trying to almost seduce the child, trying to get them ready for what that adult has in mind and wanting that person to, the, the child to trust them and that child to feel like this person cares for them. And because kids don't know, they're not prepared for evil. They don't know how to protect themselves per se. The, 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 the sad part of it, of this grooming thing, is that you literally have people playing on the innocence of those children, on the trust and the faith that those children put in adults who are supposed to be here to protect them. And it's that very trust that they then use to take advantage of these kids. It's so sad to hear what Chris is saying because, you know, she finally, at from age 9 to 14 to be molested, to finally have the, 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 the opportunity to speak to her parents, if, even if it came through the school counselors, and for the parents to not believe her. Folks, this is heavy duty. You know, teach your kids to talk to you and then listen to what they have to say. Because I've heard it time and time again. And, and I, I got to tell you, like, even when I was in college, I was a, a, in graduate school, I did a lot of work um, with how, um, you know, sexual violence on campus. We had to be trained to deal with these issues. And I was shocked once we started dealing with some of our students and they started becoming closer to us, how many of my female students I discovered were molested. And these are kids at Harvard University today. Um, so this is big stuff, and we need to be protecting our kids. I want you in this conversation, 866-OPRA-XM, 866-677-2496. You're listening to the Derek Ashong Experience, and we are discussing Oprah's special, continuing the conversation on people who molest children. Kit, you're on the air. Welcome to the experience. What's your take on Oprah's special on child molesters? Well, I think it's so important mm -hmm. for our society to be educated. Yes. And these are things we don't want to hear about. Yeah. And we have to hear the truth. We have to hear truth so we can deal with truth. And these poor kids, I have adult friends. I was never molested, but I have adult friends that were. And yes. I see how this has affected their adult life. And it, wow. it strips them of, of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the betrayal is so deep. 
I do you just, think it, it just affects my their heart. do you think it affects their relationships with their other friends like it, in what ways does that betrayal impact them as adults oh it it, it fills them full of fear and these mm-hmm. are these are incredibly talented people that I know uh-huh. and when you know to, to find out that this happened yes. I, it just blew me away but as I've Absolutely. gotten to know them on a deeper level it makes me realize that they're still full of that fear. And we're talking about mm. the fear that goes, you know, close to the core of their being. Oh. And it just, it, mm. has, it's, it has stripped them of that. And I don't know how they can build it back without a lot of work, yeah. you know, of therapy. And, but they don't want to do that because well, kid, to go back to that you pain. Know, that, I think huh. that's a great point because one of the difficulties of it is, is in order to deal with something like this, we're asking people to kind of revisit an experience that is heinous, something that they, they yeah, don't even absolutely. want to think about, something that has changed their life for the worse in a lot of ways. And yet you, you find some people, I mean, I think that Oprah is a perfect example, who took her experiences and has somehow managed to... Uh, own it in such a way that she's making it possible for the rest of us to talk about this stuff. And one of the things I'm wondering your opinion about is, okay, given that we've opened this conversation and we have uh, now, you know, it's the, the stage has been set and everyone is kind of talking about it. What can we do and what role do you think the people who are adults who've been through this experience, what role can they play in maybe helping uh, to protect uh, people who are children now, our kids today? Well, I, I, this is true on every level about everything. We, I've had to deal with addiction in my family, and until our society will deal with these painful situations and be open to hearing the truth, I don't think anything's going to happen. We mm. have to make safe places, maybe in the school. Yeah. We have to have a safe place for these kids to go yeah. to where they know they've already been betrayed yeah. and if they're betrayed again then they're they're never going to feel safe enough to open up so i don't know if oprah has done an incredible thing for the yes. world to to open up and admit what happened to her um yeah. because people judge and Absolutely. you have to get past the judgment of our society and our society is so full of judgment. Oh. And if you can get someone past that mm-hmm. to deal with it, then we just, it, it's like a domino effect. It's a good domino effect. But you have to get rid of that fear. Thank you, Kate. And that I, is you know, actually that's a, tough. That, that, I, I really actually like your suggestion uh, about having a safe place in schools. And, you know, this is the kind of thing. We get into big debates about what we should teach our children in school. But... I feel like we should be teaching our kids to protect themselves. I mean, there's got to be a way to let children know that, hey, this is not okay, and it's all right for you to come and talk to someone. You know, even if you're scared to talk to your parents, he's a counselor or he's a guardian or here's someone whom you can speak to to really try to to, um, express yourself no matter what happens so that these kids know that there's a resource. Thank you so much for calling, Kit. We want to hear from you guys. 866-OPRA-XM, 866-677-2496. We've got a couple of callers on the line, but we also have some interesting comments coming in online. Uh, We've got (coughs) Jet Essence says, I am anti-death penalty, period. This topic is tough because these sexual offenders see that they cannot be rehabilitated. So what do you do with them? Lock them up forever? That's a great uh, question, Jet Essence. What do you do if someone, it appears that they have a problem that cannot be fixed? Do we just let them out? You know, there's a, a case in California now or I was hearing it about it on NPR maybe a week or so ago, when they're talking about some of these rules, these laws that are protecting, are supposed to protect children from child molestation and basically are tracking molesters once they get out of prison. But some of the people are claiming that 20 years later, they have been um, rehabilitated. You know, H- how do we know? And is it a risk worth taking? Is it possible that a person could be redeemed? I want to hear your thoughts. Linda, welcome to the show. What do you think? Can Hi, child molesters ever be redeemed rehabilitated rehabilitated I'm not, an, I'm not an expert it would take a real expert for me to be able to even to answer that and that is a really good question that that gentleman brings up about yeah. you incarcerate them forever 
Um, I don't really have an opinion of that, about that. I'd have to think about it for a long time. Okay. Um, I think we have such an over-sexualized society, mm-hmm. and even before that, because many, many years ago I taught elementary school, and I found children were very sexualized, and I suddenly got a, a view into mm-hmm. feelings that I just thought I had proper boundaries, but yeah. I got a window into the sedu- how seductive a child could be. Well, Linda, you know or it's an adult. It's you know it's very interesting that you bring that up because la- just this week on the news, there's a case. So you know, every year in Brazil they have carnival. And there is a case now before the Brazilian courts because they have these, in Rio, they have these carnival queens and they're all gorgeous women. And, you know, we we even stereotypically sexualize Brazilian culture in particular. Well, these are like the hottest women of Brazilian culture and they very skimpy outfits and whatnot and they dance in carnival and it's a big party and it's fun. However, one of the carnival queens this year is like a seven or eight year old girl. And they put her in those same outfits, and she's dancing a traditional samba, but which, which is fine. But a samba is a sexual, s- sexual kind of dance, and if you see a kid doing it, it doesn't come off that way until you put her in this little tiny, fluttery bikini like all of the other beauty queens. And now it's literally in the Brazilian courts, is this okay to allow these kids to be sexualized at a stage when they don't even know what they're doing? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think they know, actually. And I think okay. these little girls, I think sexual feelings begin for some people, not everybody, uh-huh. when they're very young. Yeah. And um, I also think that because we have so many divorces uh-huh. and so much sexual activity going on where uh, parents are now involved with other people, they have new babies, there's a lot of sexualization mm. in the household okay. besides on TV. So it's all around us. And uh, I don't know how you teach proper boundaries. I thought the show was awesome because it showed normal people, to me, normal men or men. If so many people do it, there's a part of of our nature, there's a part of people that is like this, or it wouldn't be so, the numbers would not be so huge. So, Linda, it's, you know, a, a I'm part getting... part of human nature that does this. I think it's a, it's a tough choice. Uh, it's a tough question. You know, I'm getting a, a little pushback from some of our listeners. Jet Essence is saying, I don't buy the argument that Carla Linda is giving. The child doesn't have to have been in a bra and underwear for a predator to get his fix. I don't agree with dressing kids as adults, but come on. Um, and that, But yet, Sojourner for Truth is saying, well, everyone is born a sexual being. So part of what I want to ask you, Linda, is, you know, what about these folks who are uh, finding children who are in their families, you know, and the kid is just living. They're not yeah. dressed up into some kind of That's object, true. you know, and yet it's still happening. Do, are you saying that you think it can be regular people doing these terrible things? Or is it that certain people maybe have a predilection and could do it to any child? That's a really good question. Yes, some have a predilection, but some people are challenged with boundary issues that mm. that they were not aware of, especially if it's a 15 or a 12-year-old kid yeah. who hears his mother, have whose mother is dating someone maybe very seriously, yeah. and overhears them having sexual contact in the next room. Yeah. And that's a very stimulating experience, I think, for gotcha. people, if we all put it out on the table. Yeah. Especially Linda, I appreciate... I appreciate your call, and, and you're, you're making a powerful point. One of the things that Oprah did bring up is that, the, for, and this is something nobody wants to talk about because it's really tough, but that the, for, the ki- for the child, sometimes the physical experience is pleasurable, and that's not an accident. What the molesters do is try to make the child feel comfortable and safe, and this is something good, but the psychological damage is everlasting. And we have to be able to figure out what's really going on here. Now, because this is something that I literally have no expertise in, and like I said, you know, it's a tough issue. We're getting a lot of comments. We're going to come back to some of the notes that are coming from people online, but we're going to talk to a break, take it to a break. And when we come back, Dr. Charles Sophie is going to be joining us here in the studio. He's the medical director for the LA County. County Department of Children and Family Services. We want you to join in the conversation. We'll be right back with Dr. Sophie. Derek Gashong. Thank you so much for joining us.
listening to Oprah Radio. Welcome back to the Derek Ashong Experience. Streaming live online at OprahRadio.com. Here's Derek Ashong. Hey, y'all, this is Derek Ashong, DNA in the house. You're listening to the Derek Ashong Experience. For those that want to check us out online, you can actually absolutely find us at OprahRadio.com and at Facebook.com slash Derek Ashong Experience, as well as Ustream.tv slash Derek Ashong Experience. We are talking right now um, about a very, very serious topic, and we are happy to have an in-studio guest. The topic that we're covering is child molestation, and we're specifically discussing it because Oprah had a special on the air on television this week where she talked to child molesters about what they've done and why. And yesterday and today, she also had a conversation where people called in to talk about what they thought of that special. So we want to know your thoughts. Now, we want to have uh, you guys be involved in this conversation. Dr. Sobey is an yes. expert. And first of all, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank really you. appreciate it. It's an honor for me. So I want to jump right into this. We've got sure. Chris. Anyone can call us. Join the conversation. We're at 866-OPRA-XM, 866-677-2496. We have Chris on the line. Chris, do you have a question for Dr. Sophie? Hi, Chris. Hi. Yes, I do. Um, thank you for having this show. I think it's a really important topic. Absolutely. Um, I, I had an experience last week with my daughter, who is six years old. I overheard her talking with her younger brother, asking him to touch her um, and um, in her private areas, and he had no interest at all. But she, um, she was really almost being kind of seductive with him and asking him to help her put on her underwear and saying, oh, you can touch me there. And it really scared me because it made me realize maybe someone had been saying this to her. Right. right. Um, and so I took her aside and we had a conversation about it and I asked her if anyone had ever done that to her or, um, you know, and she said no. She was very embarrassed about the conversation. Um, and I was trying to stress that if someone had said these things to her or anything, it wouldn't be her fault. Um, but I, it was just such a difficult conversation to have, and I want to make sure that um, that I keep those lines of communication open with her. And so I'm looking for some suggestions on what to do if you do suspect that maybe, you know, your child has been molested or someone is possibly this grooming is them. very interesting, Chris, and because she's getting it. But Chris, thank you so much for bringing this up. She's getting at a really interesting topic. Yep. There's got to be a certain natural way that human beings right. are sexual beings right. and that we grow and express it. But Absolutely. how do you know when it's normal and at what stage it happens and if maybe your child is learning something because someone is taking advantage of them? I mean, clearly, children are children. There's a mm -hmm. normal developmental timeline for these, for these kinds of things to evolve. So yes. I think you're doing a great job by making her feel safe that you're asking her, you're not judging her, you're making it emotionally safe for her to talk, but you also have to see if she's been stimulated somehow, either mm -hmm. she's seen something, heard something, if no one has actually touched her, is she seeing something in someone else's house? So you look at those things, ask her those things, but then also relinquish some of this to your doctor. Your family mm -hmm. doctor, your pediatrician should be able to have those conversations and be able to understand it better from her developmental timeline. Girls do develop quicker than boys, yes, uh -huh. but those kinds of conversations don't just come out of nowhere. Yeah. So she's seen or heard something, something, and I think you should just explore that a little deeper, see where these play dates are, see what's going on in the other homes, but I think you're being a great proactive parent to be able to make your child feel safe, and then take it from there, and whatever emerges, that's what you'll then know what to do as the next step. And Chris, can we ask how old your kids are? Yeah, my daughter is six, and um, my son is um, three and a half. Right. It's not out of the range. Um, it's not out of the abnormal, normal range kind of thing. But mm -hmm. just, you know, you're doing the right stuff. Your ears are perked up. You see some red flags. Address them. Start the dynamic with your daughter so that she's safe to come to you no matter what. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for that. I want to actually make a couple of notes that people are telling us um, online. You know, one person is asking uh, CNM The Room Live, do I think harsh penalties are the way to go? I think that this is, is really tough because the, I don't know what to say with as far as penalty is yeah. concerned. And one of the things I'm wondering, Dr. Sophie, is, is this something that 
people where people can be rehabilitated? Well, you know, as, as the medical director here, we're the largest child welfare system in the country. So we have mm -hmm. about 40,000 children under our watch. Mm -hmm. About 10,000 of those children have been sexually abused, besides emotional. One in four? Absolutely. It's, it's pretty prevalent. And a lot of times, I'd say seven out of ten times, it's a family member or somebody they know. Okay. So you're, we deal with the perpetrator and we deal with the victim and we deal with siblings and families and trying to put them back together. So in the rehabilitation process, you can't group every perpetrator under the same umbrella. Gotcha. Everybody's different. And uh -huh. so we try to do an evaluation process to see where they would fit and what they would benefit most from. And can they get back to their family? Mm -hmm. Can their family be safe around them? Can they be safe? Or should they be in a rehabilitation program that will take them down a different path? So everybody's different. But yeah, yeah there is some rehabilitation to some degree and hey, just because I'm still trying to comprehend what it's all about what do you see and I know you can't give us the answers to everything but what why do people do this well you know you look at this kind of thing as a medical problem uh -huh. I know people get angry about it and they're they're violated and their family members are violated but some of it is genetics uh -huh. Some of it is experiential in their own lives. Okay. And most often perpetrators have been victims at some point mm -hmm. in their life and never I got the treatment. And yes. so we've got to start to treat people so that they don't keep that ball rolling. Okay. you got That's actually a very powerful point. You guys, you're listening to the Derek Shong Experience, and you can call us. We want you to join this conversation. We're at 866-OPRA-XM, 866-677-2496. We are talking about child molestation, what is happening to our children, the people who are perpetrating these points. And we're here with Dr. Sophie, who is an expert here in Los Angeles, working with families, children, perpetrators, the entire gamut who is giving us the opportunity to understand a little bit better what this is all about and hopefully how we can better protect our kids. 866-677-2496. Join the conversation. Belinda, you are on the Derek Shong Experience. Do you have a question for Dr. Sophie? Hi. Hi. There's probably so many questions, but I guess what I have mainly is a, a, a comment or several little comments. Um, I was molested almost 60 years ago uh, mm. for an extended period of time by a, uh, my father, a uh, close uh, relative, obviously. Mm. And, um, and the whole thing about telling, I did tell one time my uh -huh. mother. There, there was the disbelief, and then there was the um, uh, sense of blowing the family apart, not communicating, keeping it secret, um, uh, in order to keep other members from being damaged. And when I finally actually ran away from um, home and uh, ended up, I did go to college, uh, put myself through college, mm -hmm. and had a, almost a breakdown in talk. It was the only time I ever indicated to anybody that anything had happened was a doctor that I saw at the at a university I was attending, and he told me that I had to stop forgiving um, my parents. Uh, uh, until I stopped forgiving them, I would not be okay. And So he was saying that you had to come to grips with your own, I guess, anger or feelings of betrayal. Right. Yes, and move on. Right. And that's what, at that point, I decided that mm -hmm. there was no need for me to maintain right. any contact at all and mm -hmm. just move on. Just yeah, you move have, on. To, you I have can't to separate deal with yourself. The forgiveness. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. I, I didn't, I wasn't, there was no anger. Right. No anger anymore. There mm -hmm. was just, I wanted to be away for, from it because I had, I had suffered the, the whole thing of not being believed, having yeah. told that didn't work out. Right. The, the whole thing I said, I had to move on. I right. mean, this is 60 years later and I've had very successful. Mm -hmm. The only thing is now I have um, uh, children in their 20s who have found out from one of my siblings that this has occurred, and they have curiosity about it. And I said, this is one thing I'll never now, talk about. Now, this is a int very interesting thing, Belinda, because I'm wondering, Dr. Sophie, so Belinda's had this experience. She's gone through her own process of coming through with it, but she also very, it seems very natural that she feels uncomfortable discussing it with her children. Right. But how can those children learn and their children learn and their children right. learn 
I, I mean, the problem with a situation like this, and it happens often, is when a child tells a parent what mm-hmm. happened, they tell them they they don't believe them. Yeah. So then that that child is re-traumatized. They got mm. pulled into that mess in the beginning because they trusted that individual. In this yes. case, her father. Mm-hmm. Then when she tells, she gets you know beaten down again, and her self-esteem and her trust is beaten again. Yes. So she's re-traumatized. So she's not comfortable. She doesn't believe in herself. Mm-hmm. So in order to move away and, and believe in herself, she built her own life. And at some mm-hmm. point, it came up again. She lets go of it. But you've got to go the next steps of your your evolution and your growth and be able to sit down with your children and come forward with this stuff to, so they understand that you're human, you've dealt with it, you're okay with it, and you're empowering yourself to move past it and let go. This is the second time now in your life you're going to be able to let go of a lot more of this stuff yeah well you know we're getting some more comments from our people online this is definitely people have got a lot to say on this topic uh a 1776 patriot says child molestation is murder my sister's life was over at seven years old you know this is one of the things that strikes me so much about this is how much how prevalent it appears to be. And one of the things that I remember when we graduated from college, and you know, we all, college is the first time where you're independent and you're outside of your family home and you're interacting with people of the same gender and opposite gender together a lot in very intimate settings. And so we started to develop much deeper relationships. By the time we came out of college, I remember talking to my roommate who was a guy and we were talking about one of our friends who had attempted suicide. And we were saying, like, you know, this is crazy. Like, a friend attempts suicide, and then you come to find out that she had been molested when she was a kid, and they'd never had anything to do with it. And the scary part was we started thinking about not how many of our female friends had been molested, but how many of them had not been right because it seemed so prevalent so prevalent right and so many people have it it happens to them they get ashamed they put it away they feel they Mm -hmm. never have to deal with it again but what they don't understand is it translates and trickles out into intimacy issues inability to have safe relationships emotionally most marriages of somebody who has not dealt with this stuff will Mm -hmm. only go to a certain point and then they Mm -hmm. don't go any further and that's the breakdown of marriages oftentimes or why life doesn't work for them yeah you got to deal with it and so when this guy says his seven-year-old sister was murdered probably there was a huge part of her that was killed because it was never revived and treated and brought back to life wow so all right so now we've set the stage and we've opened up the dialogue and oprah has done it in a really challenging way very good you know what what can we do how do we help the children um to be safer our kids to be safer and and i'm going to go out on a limb here and say how do we help those people who have been molesters to not be so what are the ways in which we can better protect our kids and better teach folks especially because you know it it does um i have heard and you mentioned that a lot of the perpetrators have been molested themselves right so it seems like a right. cyclical crime it's a whole cycle that doesn't get broken we it, need to break that cycle exactly oprah starts that she well, puts that out into the open well one of the things that is tough and and i'm getting it from uh, a lot of our comments is that you know we feel angry about this it's sure. like i think like if i had a kid and somebody were to hurt them like i i don't have sympathy for that person right. and yet that person may have been that kid 30, 40, 50 years ago. Right, but that person that violated your child could be your uncle, could be your father, oh. could be somebody. There's all those triangles and those feelings. Yeah. So education is the biggest thing. Let's educate our children in the right place. Mm-hmm. School. Okay. Let's educate our parents. Let's em- empower people to be able to come out safely and, and deal with some of their stuff. A lot of perpetrators want help. They just don't know where to go, and they stay in these cycles. And it doesn't mean that they're okay and their behavior is okay, but it yeah. means like if we are going to take this village that it takes to raise children, yeah. we also have to help the people that are not strong as adults to either get on their feet and handle it right or get out and move off to a side of society where we know they're going to be safe and others will be safe. Yeah. You know, I want to uh, take uh, and expand on this a little bit. Uh, we have an interesting comment coming from Sojourner for Truth. She says, so grateful that a man is in the center of the conversation. All too often, Derek, men are spectators in this conversation while women are responsible for initiating and facilitating both the conversation and the healing. Right. I know that there are other men who have the convo, but we need you to be more visible and vocal. Right. So right. that that brings up a very interesting topic because it's almost like, you know, you're right. And, and Oprah has brought it up, but it always seems that it's a woman that's saying, hey, this is what's that's happening. Right. Right. How can men be more a part of the solution? 
I think men need to be more present in their families. Mm -hmm. And I think if they're more present in their families, then their children are going to feel safer. And I think that's an overall takes the responsibility off of the women who have to oftentimes bear these roles. Mm -hmm. You don't see it necessarily happening to little boys as often as it is to little girls. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is the relationship between mothers and daughters. And Uh so, I mean, I just honestly, I just wrote a book about all this. And I think it's important for parents to really get themselves back to basics. Family need to be families. Fathers yes. need to be involved. Mothers need to be involved. Children need to be raised by their parents. And if their parents are involved, especially the fathers, I think a lot of this stuff would lessen. Really, I definitely do. And, and how does the involvement of the father help to lessen the problem? Because a mother doesn't have all of that on her, number one. Gotcha. Number two, he is an integrated person into that family who brings in a whole nother dynamic, mm-hmm. some strength, some clarity, some mm-hmm. balance. You need to have that. If there is a family with a father in it, they need to be in it. Yes. That, that's the bottom line. So th- that, that's a great, great, great point. I mean, what we're saying here then is that part of what's going on is a result of the breakdown of the family. Of course. I mean, the basics, eat together as a family, yeah. be together as a family, allow your children to connect and feel you and you feel them. Kids won't stray. Strangers don't get into your house that way. Yes. I was on, on one of the specials. I mean, this little girl was lured into a, a, a RV. Yeah. Where were her parents? Yeah. You know, where, where were her parents? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's so it's, you know, my parents used to say something to me when I was a kid that I never understood. They always said to me, you know, like, you can't watch this TV show. You can't listen to this song. You can't do this. And, of course, we snuck and did a bunch of the things right. we wanted to do. I had my NWA tapes blasting in right. my room when I was 15. Just, right. But just at the level where my mom couldn't, couldn't hear if she was right, standing outside right. the door. But one of the things that um, they always used to say is we want you to maintain your innocence. We want you to maintain right. your innocence for right. as long as you exactly. can. Exactly. Right. Um, and I never understood it as a child, but now I'm so thankful sure. for it. I mean, the other thing is you have to balance all of these conversations with not pushing it to the point where your mm-hmm. child has these odd, freaky feelings about sex mm-hmm. and intimacy and trusting people. You have to be raising your children. You have to be with your child to be able to guide them. A yes. lot of these perpetrators have dysregulated brains, mm-hmm. no matter what genetics kicks in gotcha. so you have a guy who has bad judgment and inability uh-huh. to control his impulses and you have a six-year-old who isn't supposed to have impulse control and yeah. the two of them can't make good decisions yeah and no one's overseeing that yeah so the ch- the parents have to take their responsibility yes. seriously to protect yes. their children join us on this conversation 866 oprah xm 866 677 2496 you're listening to the Derek ashong experience and we're talking about how to protect our children may lisa welcome to the show do you have a question for dr sophie hi um, hello, and um, good morning, everybody. I was actually, I mean, there's many things that a person could say on this topic, of course. However, the one thing that stuck out to me during this uh, radio um, announcement is, you know, being able to see that somebody else had been molested themselves, you know, 40 years ago or whatever, and um, them doing it. It's very difficult for me as a person who was molested myself to actually see that because I am a mother of children and, you know, there may have been children, I guess, that were molested that feel, I guess, feel good. It never was like that for me. Mm. And I, you know, I was determined that I was going to break the cycle. It's never entered my mind at all to put my children through what I was put through. Good for you. Mm. Good for you. Excellent. You know, so it's hard to see that sympathy for somebody who you know, has done that. Does Melissa, that, make sense? The, I, I, that that is where I began the show um, because I completely feel you. It's difficult to to have that sense of sympathy for somebody sure, who's done something is. that is so heinous and that right. our society reviles, right. and yet. There's a problem because on the one hand, we all are like, this is terrible, and yet it's happening so much. Right. So one of the things I'm wondering is, let's say, you know, in the typical community, uh, and you, we work here in a big city, um, but I guess this, this applies all over the country. Right. In a typical community, we all think this is something so bad it could never happen, and yet it's happening a lot. Right. Where is the disconnect between our rhetoric and the reality of what's going on in our communities? Believe it or not, sometimes within cultures, mm-hmm. it's a understandable, not acceptable, but an understandable phenomenon. 
And as you see this go across different cultures, different nations, sometimes it's an ex it's an understandable thing in a family. And par mothers are not shocked sometimes that it's their husbands that are, are perpetrators or their fathers. And though it is a problem here in uh -huh. this country because of our laws and it is reportable abuse, other places it may not be in the world. So you got it. We have to take that into account. But nonetheless, uh -huh. we have to follow our mandates and we have yeah. to break these families up and tr and and work with them. But don't forget, we have to try to put these families back together. And that's mm -hmm. where some of the anger and the emotion is in the way, because it was grandpa. It was dad. It was uncle. It was brother. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Well, it, you know, for those who are just joining us, you're listening to the Derek Ashong experience. We're actually talking about a show that Oprah had on her I was on the Oprah Winfrey show where she spoke to child molesters and we heard their opinions and their thoughts and their impulses why they did what they did and she had a live conversation yesterday on the air and we just re-aired it on Oprah radio where she talked to people about their experiences and now we're here with an expert medical doctor Dr. Sophie who's giving us some insight into how these issues impact our lives and how we can uh, better protect our kids we're going to take a quick break and when we come now, we're going to go back again to some specifics of what we can do to make a difference. And Dr. Sophie is going to help us with that. Thanks so much for listening to the Derek Shong Experience. We'll be right back. Thank you so much. I really Derek, can you talk?
Radio and OprahRadio.com. You can join the experience. Call 1-866-OPRAH-XM. Here's Derek. All right. What's up, you guys? We're back uh, listening to the Derek Ashong Experience. We are here with Dr. Sophie discussing this issue. Dr. Sophie is with the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Service, Services, and he's been giving us some insight into what is going on with children who are victims, with uh, perpetrators who are right. sometimes members of their family, right. and the whole family unit, because it seems that this is an issue that it, it's more. it's about more than just the molester and the victim. Right. It's, it's a breakdown somewhere. It's a breakdown. Right. With, and apparently within the family, within the community. So right. what I wanted to uh, do before we, we, we um, move on is just for you to give us some insight into what are the steps that we can take. Now that everyone is discussing this issue, and, and, and that's a powerful first step, what are the steps that we can take to better protect our kids? I think that we have to go slowly. Okay. I know everyone's angry and they have a lot of emotion about this and you want to fix it the mm -hmm. way to address it is to slowly look at what we need to do the first step is parents need to supervise their children mm -hmm. always wonder what's going on with your child know where your child is going yeah. make a network with other parents that you trust you know it's funny that you mentioned that because I, when i was a kid our parents would never let us go to sleepover parties right and it was so we were so annoyed because everybody goes to sleepovers we couldn't we could only sleep over at one place my right. uh, a, a family home where they, it was they like trusted we, they trusted exactly and that was it and right. but what the other thing my parents did is they made our house an open place for it, everybody to come it was like a circus those everyone kinds came of, to hang exactly. out those place. kinds of things are the basics we need to get back to on families moms uh -huh. dads they're very busy two people working in a household yeah doesn't matter. Your children have to be the focus. They have to be supervised. You have to know where they're at, who they're at. That's the first step. Okay. The second step is then if anybody's acting funny, if there's a mm -hmm. perpetrator around or somebody who's trying to play some games, they should arise in because that behavior will be so different and stand yeah. out that someone will be able to nab them. But if you have your child protected and educated, mm -hmm. that's the key. Schools should do it. Group together as parents, uh -huh. at, at, as, as groups of parents, and educate each other. Yeah. Look this stuff up. Educate yourself. It's all yes. over the Internet. So education, supervision, two it, big steps. You know, and almost every topic that we talk about. I gave a speech uh, a few days ago, and I'll get to it later in Madison, about some completely separate things. But the fundamental thing I was telling the students I met with and the community members is that in order to address any problem, we've got to educate ourselves about sure, what's going on. Sure, that's the power. On. Power pa is education. Absolutely. The power is education. Yeah. Right. It really so is. this is um the the one other thing I was thinking about is as these parents go to educate themselves and, and, and parents, I'm talking directly to you right now because I know that you've got a lot on your plate. I know that you're working hard. I know that you're doing the best you can for your kids and you're trying to find a way to just keep things going for them. But it is critical that these parents, that our parents, that you Watch your children. Right. It's critical that you watch your children. Right. And I started out saying that in certain cultures, we know that there's a, um, there's a whole community that's watching them. And we are going to sure. do our best Absolutely. in that way. But it's critical for the parents themselves to be involved and invested. It is. And, and if moms and dads, and it's fully understandable, don't know what to look for, mm -hmm. educate yourself. Get on yeah. the Internet. Ask questions. Talk to your doctor, clergy member. They are mandated reporters of child abuse who mm -hmm. can educate you. Come to my website. Call your local Department of Children and Family Service. There are mm -hmm. ways to educate so you do know what to look for and you do know the ways to talk to your child. Absolutely. Well, I personally am advocating that uh, we have programs in schools yep. where the kids can have, because I, I think that the critical thing I'm getting out of this conversation is the idea that people have got to have somewhere they can go right. where they can feel right. safe. There's one other thing I think is important. With every child that gets sexually molested, it's not just sexual molestation, it's emotional abuse, it's mm. neglect, it's mm -hmm. physical abuse, it's a huge amount of mm. abuse. That's where people get murdered and die in the middle of this. This is where children okay. die because it's not just they got sexually violated, they got emotionally violated, physically violated, intellectually violated. On every level, they're stripped. So it's, it's almost like a broader case of yes. child neglect Absolutely. and abuse. And so Absolutely. And so if we, sometimes if we see signs of certain kinds of neglect, it's possible exactly. it could be leading to others. Exactly. Right, y'all. Yeah. So we're talking about this. It's a holistic problem. Right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sophie, for joining us. We're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to flip the script. We're going to talk a little bit about some things happening in the world and with something that I think is profoundly inspiring 
inspiring. That inspiration is coming right after the break. Dr. Sophie, thank you so much. Dr. Sophie's book is called Side by Side, the Revolutionary Mother-Daughter Program for Conflict-Free Communication. Check it out on Amazon.com. Thank you so much, sir. See you. Cheers. Thank you.